Well, good morning and welcome to our van podcast here in uh, the fall, October 2022. I'm Michael Van Avery. Uh, You can find the van podcast on any place you find podcasts, but specifically at Anchor, Spotify, Google, and YouTube. So I'm really happy to have uh, someone who's very familiar to us here in Santa Clara County and uh, one of our great leaders here in town. Um, Supervisor Susan Ellenberg. Welcome. Good morning. Hey, Michael. Great to be here. Yeah, it's uh, it's fun to have you. Um, there's so many great things going on at the county, and um, it seems like we're you know moving past COVID a little bit and uh, into a new kind of era. Um, I guess just kind of out of the gate. I mean, you know, not that I want to spend too much time on COVID, but there's been so much work that's been done by the county. I'd probably be remiss not to say it. Um, how, you know, how are you feeling about the, where we're moving from COVID into the new world? I'm so proud of the work that the county did during the, the height of the crisis. I think the vaccination rate that we achieved and the um, relatively low number of, of terrible outcomes really speaks well to the county administration, to the public health officer, and, re- and even more so to the residents of the county that stepped up and said, well, we don't like this, but we're going to follow the rules. We're going to stay home and we're going to wear a mask and we're going to get our shots and we're going to do whatever we need to do to move us past this. Yeah. And you've been a great leader. I know uh, in coordination with your colleagues on the board, you, you, you just have been fantastic leaders. And, and that's one of the reasons why I wanted to talk with you today. I felt like you know, a lot of times people don't necessarily know what supervisors do. We're going to talk a little bit about that today. And some, I think, it, really good issues, issues, current issues that relate uh, to individuals, to businesses, and of course to our elected officials. But, um, and of course, you're also uh, you're married to a great guy that uh, I, I I love dearly. And how's he doing these days? Oh, he's doing great, and he will be thrilled to have the shout out <laughs> from you on the podcast. Yeah, real quick, we're talking about the great Steve Ellenberg and. Uh, uh, one of the, the really great business attorneys in Santa Clara County. So uh, for those of you, not that I often promote lawyers, but this one I will. He's so a good one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you kind of have to say that, don't you? <laughs> well, Susan, you know, um, I think your journey is kind of interesting. And I don't know if everybody knows but what's so great about Silicon Valley and Santa Clara County is that we come from all parts of the planet. It's such a wonderful place to be from. So I kind of wanted to talk a little bit about that with you and you know, just briefly on your background and yeah, so where, where, where's Susan Ellenberg from and, and kind of how did she get to San Jose? Sure. So I grew up in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, which is the Midwest part of the state. Philadelphia is definitely the East Coast. Um, so it's, it's a different vibe. I left after high school and I went to uh, New York City to go to college at Barnard, which is the Women's College of Columbia University. Had just a fantastic experience there. Stayed in New York after I graduated from college. I worked, and then um, when I was applying, I de- decided to apply to law school. And decided is sort of a, a an in quotation word. I had a lot of pressure to apply to law school oh. because I had no chance of getting into medical school. Mm. So um, I pl- I had lots of applications, and one of the law school applications I had was for Stanford, and. I didn't know anything really about California. It was kind of hippies in Berkeley, movie stars in LA, and that was about it. Certainly hadn't heard of Palo Alto. The brochure was beautiful, but it freaked me out. I kept it in my desk, applied to Columbia, where I was already living, got in, uh, went to law school at Columbia, and I met that future great lawyer there, Steve Ellenberg, who was from San Jose. And from like the second date... He was pumping the city. His family has a, a code called GU for the, the, the prospective girlfriends. Is she geographically undesirable? <laughs> Which I thought was horrifying at the time. But he really sold the city to me. And the way he talked about San Jose was that this is a place where it doesn't matter where you've come from. It doesn't matter what your bank balance is. If you move in and say, hi, I'm here. I want to get involved. You are welcomed. And I found that to be precisely the case. I think I want to date Steve Ellenberg. <laughs> Too late. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's funny because I would tell you that I had a similar GU with my, you know, <laughs> wife as well. And, and I, 
I think everything you were just saying kind of reminded me of, of, of the way I felt and feel about San Jose as well. And um, so that that's wonderful. And so you you decided that, you know, I'm going to give this a chance. I would give it a try. We moved here in 1991, right after I graduated um, uh, from from law school. And this city has become my home. It's 30 years. And I am a booster. I love being part of this community. Uh, it's wonderful now to be in a position where I have the opportunity to, to contribute to the welfare of the, the residents. So it was a good move by him. Yeah, and you've, you've raised a, a beautiful family here. And, and I know they're all off and running and, and doing their things in the world. And so, you know, it's... it's and I, I guess I kind of want to talk a little bit about how you you came to San Jose in 1991, and you raised, started raising your family, of course, and did a great job with that. And I guess you you had an interest in politics. I had an interest in politics. Wait, is that because you're a lawyer? You want, or, or, what, 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 why? <laughs> why did you want to be in politics? Why? So that came so much later. I didn't initially. Uh-huh. I, I really, I was interested in issues and current events and Steve was very interested in politics and he was very supportive of candidates um, early on Mike Honda uh, before he uh, before he was in Congress uh, Zoe Lofgren Jim Bell lots of um, candidates that he was excited about and wanted to support and my in-laws were very involved they were both on the Central Committee uh, for the Democratic Party, for the county. They were very involved in races. So early on, I started paying attention through their lens. Uh, and my my mother-in-law and aunt were very close friends with Susan Hammer, um, who was 1991, remote, what year was she elected? Mayor? Uh, she would have been elected in 88. Okay, so she was, she was, she was still the mayor, and she actually had... An, a significant influence on me, not for politics early on, but how to be comfortable as a new mom with my with my choices. Um, I practiced law for three years when we moved here, mm-hmm. and uh, was working at Roper's Majeski when I I got pregnant, had the baby, and. Susan came over for a visit, just, you know, here's the baby present, he's so darling. And we were sitting on my sofa, and she said, so how are you doing? And mind you, we weren't close. She was very close friends with my mother-in-law and aunt. We were friendly. I started to say, I'm fine, and I burst into tears. Mm. And you know Susan, and her her demeanor is, sure. is a little bit formal. She reached across the sofa and just patted my knee and said, they're there. <laughs> <laughs> And I spilled this whole sobby story that I had, you know, barely finished my education. I was only three years into a career. Law school is a very expensive investment. And I so much wanted to stay home with my baby, but I felt that that's not feminist. That's too early in my career. A million voices telling me why not to do that. And she smiled at me and she said, Susan, sequencing. I had no idea what she was talking about, so I kept crying and said, I don't know what you mean. And she said, you can do everything you want to do. You do not have to do it all at the same time. This is your time to be with your baby. Be with your baby, and you'll know when it's time to do something else. And Michael, the flood of relief that I felt, that that validation from this woman who was in such a position of power Mm -hmm. and and good repute um, was heavily influential to me. And that, that word has stayed with me for 30 years, and her, her influence continued um, in, in later years that I imagine we'll get to if you want to talk about the political journey. Oh, yeah, I <laughs> certainly do. And, and you know, I, I, I just love listening to stories about uh, former Mayor Susan Hammer and, of course, Phil Hammer and the the influence that she had on San Jose and, and still does to this day. And, uh, you know, I was a young man uh, out of college and I had a chance to work with her when she was mayor. Um, and she had a way of being warm while being stoic. That is a fantastic description. Yes. Yeah. And made you feel uh, important, even if you were just, you know, 
an intern or she, she treated everybody the same. And I think it's interesting that someone that maybe, uh, you know, you, you weren't going to go up and give her a big hug. She was going to give you a nice firm handshake and, and like you said, provides, uh, lots of motivation for you. Um, but at the same time, she was a stiff upper lip, uh, you know, take care of your business and sequencing. Wow. What, 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 that kind of is the key to life, isn't it? Right. It, and, and certainly it's a privilege to be able to do that. And, and I am well aware that there were, you know, were and continue to be so many new moms uh, who are not in a position where they can decide, now I'm going to be home later, I'm going to resume my career or begin a new career. Uh, and in fact, we're, we're I'm jumping a little bit all it's over okay. the place, and I know you have a nicely planned agenda. No, you can do whatever you want. One of the reasons that childcare is such an important part of my platform as a supervisor and the work that I'm trying to do is that it is really at the heart of economic stability. Mm -hmm. And especially as, unfortunately, I think we move into a recession and it becomes even more important for uh, often both parents or, or a, a single mother to work and this and the biggest barrier for for women working is the lack of child care yes yeah I, 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 I think that every woman regard regardless of social economic you know situations probably has and again this is a man saying this so take it for what it's worth but it, it seems though that there's always that crossroad that that a, a woman must face as a mother on on how to take care of their family and uh it it's tough and of course it shouldn't be and and the, the way you phrased it is accurate but frustrating yeah. because it's it, you're phrasing it as the mother's responsibility yeah. and that's in fact what we saw because 90 mm. percent of the um job losses during covid were by women yeah um and and even more specifically women of color so it, it is um it, it's a situation that I think the entire community has to be responsible for, because ultimately, it really is about keeping families housed and fed and able to have income to spend in the community and to really drive the economy. And um, I'll give a, give a plug for for somebody else's work. Jennifer Siebel Newsom does mm -hmm. um, these really wonderful documentaries about very pressing social issues, and her most recent one, I believe, is called Fair Play, mm -hmm. and it tackles exactly this issue of um, of who's responsible for the childcare world, how women are, and it is women who continue to be held back. Uh, by that lack of affordable access. So it's it's an issue that I am very much committed to expanding that affordable access throughout the county. Well, we, we appreciate that. And I, as an employer, I appreciate that. Um, you know, even the, you know, we have women here at Republic Urban Properties who are mothers and um, it's a constant balance for them to work and uh, provide the child care and it's it's a heavy burden uh, and, and and sometimes they're doing it by themselves and um, it's uh, it's 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 absolutely part of the economy you're absolutely right and and employers oh. should provide if not feasible to have child care spaces stipends or or flex dollars or benefits for child care of course for family leave uh, a after the baby is born and that that's a place too this isn't a full government solution there there's a lot of responsibility i think for the private sector too to just even focus on your own employees do they have the means to 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 access that care i i, d I totally agree with you and and you know just to promote republic a little bit we um, we, we've had uh, several women have children here, um, and we, we prefer not for them to go on disability. We prefer for them to just continue to, you know, take their salary, take their time. Uh, you know, we, we, we recognize the, the sacrifice and, and the amount of time that it takes to, to recover, to, you know, get, get their, their bearings and with their family, with their husband, too, and... Um, so we're, we're, you know, we, I think we have ultimate flexibility on that. And, uh, same thing with, uh, when the, when, whether, you know, until they're 18 years old, you're constantly taking care of them. So we also provide a very uh, aggressive, uh, paid time off. And in other words, I don't really keep track of paid time off. It's, Hey, you've got to go to the doctors. You got to pick up your daughter. You got to do this, go do it. 
Um, you know, and I actually think in a weird way, COVID has made it easier um, because I think you have to have more flexibility in the workspace regardless. You keep hearing that, um, the life balance issue. So I guess for me, um, it's been that kind of, you know, uh, green light kind of moment where I'm like, okay, you know, it makes sense. We, uh, why am I, why am I, I don't have a time clock here. Um, let's, let's make sure people are taking care of their families, yeah. you know, so, well, you know, I, I guess that was one of your launching points then, Susan, as, um, you, as your ch children got older and as Steve became partner and did different things like that. I'm going to keep bringing up Steve cause I, you know, you know, I love him, but, um, so how did you decide you wanted to kind of, cause your rise has been, been fast and, and that's usually how the great ones work. They, they, they show up and I'm just to give you my perspective, you meet them and next thing you know, they're, they're these incredible leaders in our county and, or in our city. So that's kind of how I feel about you. And so tell me, how, how did you make your rise to, to county supervisor? It, it's, it seems like you've just, uh, you're, you're a superstar. Thank you. Thank you. That's, that's very kind and perhaps a tiny bit silly, but <laughs> <laughs> part of the the sense from a lot of people in the political sector that I appeared out of nowhere is really demonstrative to me of the narrow lens mm. that, that we often have of who's making a difference in our community. Because I, from the, the time I got here, I have been involved in you know, supporting nonprofit organizations and serving on boards. Um, I was very active in my, in my kids' elementary school and, and one of the the growths that I had that that still stays with me as, as one of the most important things I've ever done is when we expanded the school from a K-5 to a K-8, I developed and then later taught for six years a social justice curriculum mm -hmm. to sixth, seventh, and eighth graders. And the focus was on community engagement. And the fundamental question was, what does every member of a community need for that, for that whole community to thrive? And it, and it's clear, it's six things. It's safe and stable housing. It's access to sufficient nutrition every day. It's high quality health care, high quality education, opportunity to work and earn a wage that allows you to care for your family. Mm -hmm. So when we look at that as the basis, who doesn't have it in our community? And my students and I spent a lot of time understanding who didn't have those things. Why not? Who's already helping and where are the gaps? And how can those gaps be filled? So. I learned at least as much as my students through those six years because we engaged all over the community, mm -hmm. um, not only with CBOs, but with lots of political offices because we understood that often you need to change policies and you need to have relationships with your electeds so that you have their ear and, and you can influence policy. So I did that for six years. Um, uh, afterward, I, I also worked at the um, the Chamber of Commerce. It was then the the SVO, mm -hmm. and I was the director of leadership development. And I imported this was a secret at the time. I imported my social justice curriculum from middle school students to adults in a leadership development program. You don't call it social justice mm -hmm. at the chamber, so it was community engagement and leadership. But it was the same concept. Who doesn't have what they need, and what are we doing to change that? So during this time, my kids are continuing to grow up. My youngest was a freshman at Lincoln High School, and I heard about a board policy that they were talking about passing, which was to reduce the number of credits required to graduate. Mm -hmm. I thought it seemed like a bad idea, but I'm new. My kid's a freshman. I'm going to learn about this, and then I'm going to be a great champion because my child's there, so I want to support the school. And I started down this rabbit hole where nobody, nobody could give me a good answer as to why this benefited children. And my youngest daughter said to me, Mommy, you should run for school board. And I went to my eighth graders, and we discussed it. And we ran for school board in uh, 2013. And I joined the San Jose Unified School District Board in 2014. So that was my my journey, and it felt at the time like a very natural fit, sure. though it was not a long-term plan by any means. I decided, I think, nine months before the election, oh, maybe I'll do this. That's interesting. And the reason why I have such a narrow lens is I'm a real estate developer. <laughs> <laughs> 
you know how it is with real estate developers. We're just kind of, we are blinded only to our, to what's in front of us. And, and to the relationships that you need. Yeah. That's, well, you kind of, you kind of hinted that. And I think that, um, you know, look, everyone's journey in their personal life somewhere leads to, you know, hopefully community activism. And I think that's exactly. this, right. I mean, we all have uh, our side interests and our hobbies and our passions. And it sounds like, you know, public education and, you know, the community good, which obviously you're, you're leading now uh, from the very front, but that you were, you were involved in that from, its, its the, from the origin of who you are. And that's a credit to who you are. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. It's, it feels... Susan doesn't like compliments. <laughs> Susan is not super comfortable with compliments. <laughs> You're just like Mayor Hammer. All right. Mayor Hammer didn't <laughs> like compliments either. No. But listen, that on this show, I give lots of compliments. That's okay. just who I am. But, Direct know, them all to Steve because he'll eat it up. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll get some tougher issues It's here. still yeah. shocking that, that I'm in politics and he's not. <laughs> He probably says that's true, but uh, you, you guys are both really good at what you do. And so you, you are on this journey now and you're on the board, uh, the San Jose Unified Board of Trustees. And you, I'm, I'm sure you're feeling like, wow, that's a hard job, right? Because it's not an easy job. It wasn't easy, but it was, it was so eye-opening and you know, really just an exponential learning experience from what I had been teaching and learning with my students. This was on scale to see. We had 42 schools, I think, 30,000 students at the time. And the very clear thread for kids who were persistently struggling, persistently not keeping up with their peers, was so rarely about academic aptitude. It was very largely defined by socioeconomic factors for that that lack of stable housing and sufficient nutrition and being victims to or, or victims of or witnesses to violence or um, uh, family separations. There were so many challenges that are beyond the purview and beyond the ability of school districts to address. Mm. Um, we did have a program called School Link Services, or participated in a program called School Link Services, which um, Dave Cortesi actually started when he was at the Board of Supervisors. Mm. And I saw that linkage between county services and student success and started just looking much more closely at the county. And that is where at a systems level, we should be working to alleviate poverty and frankly, to push in so much more at the beginning of life than we are now to prevent a lot of these um, really challenging outcomes that hamper kids and their families for generations. So um, Ken's seat was opening. He was terming out right, in 2018. Right now, so started to think about that. Hillary lost the election in 2016, Ouch. you may remember. I and remember. Her, her speech about the, the need, quoting her, her pastor, that we need to be doing as much as we can for as many people as we can, made me think I'm not at full capacity on the school board. I can do more. I have, I have bandwidth, I have brain width, and, and I want to have a larger impact. So I ran for the supervisor. I remember, I remember, and I think you had a pretty tough field of, of opponents, um, including my old friend, good friend, Don Rocha. Uh, who else was in that race? There was somebody else too. Dominic Caserta. Oh, goodness gracious. Dominic Caserta. Yeah. Pierre Luigi. Oh gosh. Yeah. Um, there were two other, Mike Alvarado and Maria Hernandez, yeah, that, I think. It no, was no, a big, it was a big field. There were seven a, of us. Oh, and Jason Baker. Jason Baker, yeah. I mean, that's a formidable group of, of, of electeds and, and community leaders. And so you emerged from that and you, you were victorious. Um, and you've, uh, so that's been since 2018 you served on the board. How's I was just flown? elected in June in the primary ballot to a second term. Wow, time has flown, hasn't it? And uh, it, it just seems crazy that it's that that it's been four years now. And so, you you know, you've, you've been a, a, a leader. You're, you're kind of previewing a lot of the stuff you've been working on at the board. And, and I think there's some kind of issues of the day that maybe we should talk about. And, you know, I guess, and you and I had this conversation offline and I'm, I'm fascinated, frankly, um, with a lot of the state uh, policies and politics that are happening, uh, like care court and the, the budget money that's being hopefully 
uh, provided to counties from the state to address families, homelessness, and, and all the kind of myriad of issues that I know you deal with at the front line as a board of supervisor. But I, you know, it would I would be remiss uh, as news of the day would go if I didn't talk to you a little bit about you know Laura's Law, Care Court, and I saw an editorial in the paper yesterday, and it was from a, a mayor hopeful, uh, and he seemed to have some answers. Uh, for maybe how things should work. But it occurred to me that maybe I should ask Ashley, the people that are in charge, how this might work. And so I guess as a direct question, you know, how do you feel about where the county's headed with homelessness, with the court systems, and, and maybe maybe kind of addressing a little bit that editorial of your spin on it? Because in my opinion, you're the authoritative on this issue. And and someone that I know has been a leader on this issue. So I'll, I'll stop there and say, what do you think about that editorial? <laughs> All right, we'll start with that and then work out to the, the broader picture. Uh, I did read it. A, a lot of it was was very familiar. And candidate for, Matt Mayhem. Candidate Matt Mayhem or, has, or has mayor, identified Mayhem. an issue that, that many of us have been well aware of for a long time, and that's precisely why it is a priority of the county. So there, there was nothing particularly new in that. It's curious to me, of course, that he's running for mayor and offering lots of opinions on county work, and perhaps he should run for for supervisor. That might be a, a better fit. Um, but the mental health and substance use crisis, which Otto and I, Supervisor Lee and I, um, gave an official name to in January, is a very real one, and it's not a new one. Um, what's new is the broader interest in actually addressing this beyond county governments. Counties have been struggling um, with, with insufficient funds and, frankly, insufficient interests from any other level of government in addressing this, this really massive crisis. But um, with the governor's introduction of CARE Court and the Cities Association, you know, um, immediately coming to support that, to me was an exciting moment to say, well, thank you. You know, welcome to the party. I'm delighted to have attention at the state level for mental health care. Um, I'm not, I wasn't convinced and, and remain unconvinced that we needed a new court administrative system in order to do this work. And initially, in fact, the care court bill included funds only for this new court level. But the challenge that courts have been having for years, if not decades, is that there are insufficient um, treatment slots and insufficient housing mm -hmm. for people to, uh, to be treated and to recover and to maintain good health. And care court, the care court legislation initially didn't include funds for housing or facilities. And that's where we need the, the, the emphasis to be. So by the time the bill finally passed, I was, I'm part of the California State Association of Counties that, that lobbied aggressively for the better part of a year and worked hard to make improvements in what the final bill looked like. And... Um, there are, I think, about a dozen counties out of the 58 that volunteered to, to be the, the guinea pigs and, and implement this in its first year. Santa Clara, along with the rest of the counties in the state, uh, was, was given some funding to have a planning year. And I think that that's absolutely the right way to go. Are we'll we inside that planning side. year? Are we, are we inside that planning year right now? The, we haven't received the funding for it yet. I don't know exactly what the start date is, okay. but we, we've been planning for years. Sure. And the pieces that we need, and this is where our board is now really laser focused, we need to build and contract for facilities. We need to expand our workforce because we just simply don't have enough people working in this field. And that, of course, is going to come back in part to the cost of housing here. Um, we have money for programs. In fact, you know, nearly every county in the state has excess MHSA funds. So that's Mental Health Services Act funds. Those funds are very narrowly restricted in how you can spend them. So this is how school district funding used to be. Yeah. You could see a big pot of money over here 
in in A, but you needed to fund B, C, and D and couldn't touch that money. So we have MHSA funds available for programming, but if we don't have the facilities and we don't have the employees to to provide the treatment um, or contractors, then that money sits. Right. And right now, um, we are working again with the State Association of Counties, working with uh, the legislature and the governor's administration for more flexibility on those funds. There are some new funds now for uh, facilities and even for workforce, but all of this has just happened in the last year. Right. So it's exciting that city folks and state folks are now focusing on this, but counties have been here for a long time. We know this is a problem. It's not a problem we can solve by ourselves. And the opportunity for partnership with the city is tremendous. Um, uh, number one, in, in helping us build affordable housing more quickly. And as a developer, I'm, I'm sure you've got plenty of your own experiences sure. with the slow pace of development uh, permitting. We have a um, an issue right now with a building that the county is not building, a private developer is working on at 650 South Bascom, where we want to um, put a subacute, well, that might not be the right lab, level of care. Um, it's a, an inpatient um, service service provider for, uh, for mental health care. We're experiencing delays again on the city side with permitting and things that we Shocking. need to get that done. So where the cities can have a role here is really helping us move this faster. Um, I am, you know, very invested in the in the mayor's race and and as you know, have been been supporting Cindy. And one of the things that I'm so excited about is that having somebody with the depth of experience that mm -hmm. she has, and understanding both the infrastructure issues of cities and the service issues of counties knows how to work together. Um, she's she's not a finger pointer. She's not going to tell other jurisdictions what they're what they're doing wrong or what they need to do, but is going to help move the whole train faster so that we can care for more people. And as the the um, hopeful incoming chair of the Board of Supervisors, president of the Board of Supervisors, we already have a great relationship and great partnership, and we have no interest in the in the sniping and the finger pointing. We're going to work together. Yeah, I really appreciate you saying that. I mean, for years and years, uh, as myself growing up in you know, local government and working, uh, you know, in and around local government as a developer, there's, there's never been a, a, a more need of cooperation between the county and the cities. You've outlined it beautifully because the resource financially is there. Um, and, it, and that's California's problem in general. We, uh, in the last say 15 years, we, you know, we've had quite a bit of surplus and the governors, I think, in, and the legislators in general have provided you know, resources to counties and then the counties to cities. And then to your point, um, it seems like things just take too long to be implemented, at least from a citizen developer's perspective. And, um, and so now where, I, where I'm bringing this is we are, as developers, responsible for building affordable housing. Um, we, especially when we do public-private partnerships, um, we have to find ways to develop that affordable housing, but also make sure that it doesn't impede the ability to do market rate housing that's the point of the public-private partnership to, you know, everyone benefits. And in order for that to happen, there has to be extreme cooperation uh, from an intergovernment perspective. Transportation authority, county, city, uh, PG&E, water districts. It, it goes on and on and on. Yet the biggest money driver is the county now and the ability to provide funds for that affordable housing. Well, the, the county provides funds for affordable housing in a in a very narrow strip of that funding. But it's that. big money. Where, yeah, this is true. Yeah. But it's funding permanent supportive housing. Sure. Um, the, we have not focused on, to a great extent, on workforce housing and the, the higher levels of affordable housing. Because again, as a safety net provider, our focus is on the very most vulnerable. And, and we do actually have... Um, a community plan to end homelessness where 
at least on, on paper and to, and to a large extent with, with city staff. We have partnerships with the city of San Jose, with the county, with the housing authority, with CBOs, with I think VTA is part of that too. And although the um, challenge of, of the ever increasing number of people who are unhoused still seems um, almost insurmountable, we've housed almost 20,000 people. And looking at the state effort, the, the, the statewide county effort, it's amazing how far ahead we are of so many of our counties. And we, our community plan to end homelessness is actually being adopted by other counties who are stunned that our city and our county and the housing authority and the other partners do work together. Yeah. So I, I would be very nervous if that relationship would, would suffer at all. Um, the will is there. We need to make it happen faster. Well, like you said, uh, in an election season, there's a lot of finger pointing. I think that's just how it works. But I, I, I did have a blue sky question that I think my parents always reminisce about, and you've heard this probably more times than you could imagine, is, well, you know, why can't the, the state and the county and to a great extent the cities, why can't they just reopen another Ag News? Uh, mental health hospital. Why? Why don't we have? Why? Why haven't we done that? Because there, and I'm just going to give you my perspective, but I think it's a perspective that a lot of people share. When I hear the term, we're you know we're going to house everybody. There's a plan to house everybody. I can't help but think there are people that just maybe do not understand how to be housed or they have such substance abuse or mental illness. Again, they don't know how to be housed. And I think most common folk that I know, especially like my parents and people like that, they just say, gosh, if only Agnews was open. So, I mean, is there ever going to be another Agnews for, for those really who need that care? The state hospitals closed um, for a number of reasons. Uh, one was you know, reports of the horrific treatment, um, and by treatment, I don't mean medical treatment, sure, just inhumane treatment uh, by people who were consigned to spend the rest of their lives there. Um, it kept people out of view of the public, mm -hmm. but was extraordinarily harmful. Um, Reagan also, when he was the governor of California, said, you know, the state shouldn't pay for this. Let the counties pay for it. Right. So not every institution closed. There still exists today um, state-run hospitals, um, and they all have waiting lists for people to get into them. And at county at the county level, the trend following the closure of those facilities was treatment in community. Treatment in community had some positive effect and impact while the numbers were manageable. As the price of housing grew higher and higher and more and more people found themselves unhoused, that community treatment piece could not scale up to meet the need. And you're exactly right that, that, that some folks are not in a position to care for themselves and be in housing. And the challenge, of course, is that it's very hard to get sober or address your mental illness while you are unhoused. So we need a whole continuum of care, which ranges from the locked secure treatments, that treatment centers that your um, parents are talking about. One piece is that they're a lot smaller now. Um, there are structures that have been called uh, for the last number of years institutes for mental disease. They're capped at 16 people. Mm. Um, there's an interesting construction problem with that because it's very expensive to build, and once you're building, you want to build for more. Um, but we, we are not permitted to do that right now. We have samples at each level. We have some locked facilities. We have some board and cares. We have some residential crisis treatments. We do not have enough. So again, that comes back to the county. And again, I, I hate to keep foreshadowing this recession, but I'm very concerned about how much more expensive it's going to become quickly to take on debt. And I also see how freaking long it takes us to build things. Um, and Tell that's, <laughs> I don't, I don't even know that that's all on city <laughs> permitting. I, you know, I think there are not, there's the health department stuff too. too. Yeah, the health department stuff. So 
I, I'm I'm nervous about what we have to build, and and I and my colleagues have have directed staff to really look at property all over the county. What already exists, or what could private um, developers build that we could ground lease from? How do we build things faster? Yeah. And the county is not necessarily again. Remember, our business is service. Yes. Um, and we have done a lot of construction, and we do own a lot of land and a lot of facilities. Um, so I'm hoping that we can speed this process by converting and renovating and repurposing um, uh, care in in inpatient, in-house uh, residential care at at every level. And we got to have the developers keep building housing. It's such a complicated world we live in, isn't it? And uh, to listen you talk about it is. It just underscores, you know, how hard it is to get things done. But again, um, I, I think we operate in Santa Clara County with some great people, and and uh, I'm I'm excited for the future. I know a lot of people are more gloom and doom about Santa Clara County and California in general. I, I don't share that. Uh, at, even even in my darkest moment, when I when I see something like, for example, here in our building, um, the brand new building that we we just opened this year, you know, somebody graffitied it. We had homeless people kind of, you know, living in, in the, the trash uh, dispenser area. And, you know, it gets you down a little bit, but then you then you realize that there are ways to help people. And I think that's really the bottom line of the county, that it's there to help people. And, you know, we appreciate the work that you do there. I think it's a thankless job. Um, and I know you catch a lot of, you know, flack. And I think it's because of ignorance. Yeah, I um, love my job. I yeah. really do. And when I have an opportunity to explain what county does, so thank you so much for this, and to document the work that has happened, um, people are generally impressed and excited. And and I'm just as big a fan of San Jose as I was in 1991 when I moved here. And I am committed to playing my role in improving life for everyone every one of our one million city residents two million county residents deserves the opportunity to thrive well we appreciate that and um you know it's 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 fun to take a little bit of time to to be serious uh and and tackle some of the things that you you're you're dealing with every day but now it's time to kind of lighten the mood a little bit and cool and i've got a few things for you that i think uh, i we, we kind of do at the at the end of these things we're where I kind of throw out a rapid fire, a couple questions for you. And some of it's personal from some people that know you. Oh so my. we'll, uh, let's keep it uh, rated G hopefully. Oh, cool. Rapid uh, fire is not my strength, by the way. <laughs> I've never wanted to be well, a litig- litigator. Let, let, <laughs> it doesn't have, we, we'll I'm a thoughtful. It, we'll, we'll call it semi rapid okay. fire. So, right, let's um, let's start with the first one. Peaches and Lacey. Peaches and Lacey are my little dogs. Oh, dogs. They are rescues. They are now old ladies. They're 10 and 11. And we are horrible, horrible dog parents because we didn't train them. We don't discipline them. They absolutely run roughshod over us. And then they just look at us and we're like, oh, it's fine. (laughs) (laughs) I have two of those uh, at home as well. And um, so we share dog lover. Yeah, yes. They are our darlings. They're, they, and they're probably your kids now, right? They are. They are very excited when I come home. And it's been a long time. <laughs> <laughs> Even though those last five years that our kids were at home, they weren't nearly as excited as the dogs. Oh, good. Because my wife gets mad when I do the dog voices and I talk to them. And I said, honey, that's, that's not going to change. <laughs> Especially with my son <laughs> as well at right, college. You're an empty nester. Well, what about this one, the the Columbia University Marching Band? Oh, my God. (laughs) Wow, you dug deep. So to back up, I I played growing up, I played the piano and the cello, neither of which is a marching band instrument. Um, It's kind of hard to carry those. Right. Well, so is the drum, as it turns out. So the Columbia University had had a marching band. They were actually recruiting people to play because for whatever reason they were underpopulated and there was a Columbia Yale football game coming up. I had a friend at Yale and if I went with the band, I got the free bus ride to Yale and they covered my stay. So I can read music and I have decent rhythm. So I said I could play the bass drum. 
And they also looked at my height, 5'9". Yeah. You need to be, you know, have a tall enough torso to carry that. So I had Did all... you have the hat, too? I had the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> so I got fitted. I got on the bus. I, you know, said I could play the bass drum. That thing was so heavy. I bet. And it, it's clamped onto your shoulders with this metal torture device. And it was hard to see the... Um, some of the things had music. Sometimes we had to watch a conductor. I never had performed for a conductor, so I didn't know what that was about. So I played the drum for that band, Columbia, for that game, Columbia One. I said I would never do that again oh. because it hurt so much. Yeah. And Columbia didn't win another football game for the next five years. The curse of Susan Ellenberg. So it has been mentioned. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know that last part. That's fantastic. Yeah. Wow. Well, you, you've, uh, you've had an interesting and diverse uh, life, uh, Susan, and it's been fun having you here today. And again, thank you for all of your wonderful work uh, for the county. And I'm um, excited for the elections. And, uh, you know, we appreciate you being here and being on the Van Podcast, our, our fifth guest. Thank you so much. I really appreciated the opportunity and love that you're interested in all of this work. Great, great. Well, again, uh, this has been a, a van podcast with uh, County Supervisor Susan Ellenberg. Um, again, you can find this on most of your podcast locations, including Google, YouTube, Spotify, or wherever you find your podcast. So I'm Michael Van Avery, and we'll see you soon.